Welcome to the second part of our series, Prepping Essentials, where in the first video, we learned about and built a 72 hour kit. In this video, we're gonna cover preparing the 72 hour kit for infants, children, the elderly, and those with medical conditions. At some point in our lives, we're gonna be young or old, injured or ill, and preparing in advance will give you comfort and peace of mind. Now we all agree babies are wonderful gifts from God. Any parent knows that anytime you leave the house, you need to have a bag prepared for everything you need until you get back home. And that's just a couple hours. And once you get back home, you have to resupply the entire bag. Everything from formula and snacks to diapers and clothes must be repacked. Just like when we created our 72 hour kit in the bucket for ourselves, it's also important to have a bucket packaged and ready to go with everything you need for an infant. You need to figure out how many diapers they're going to need to use in three days, how much formula or water you're going to need, baby wipes, clothes, blankets, toys, medications like Motrin and Tylenol are just a few things that you will need to pack away in the event you need to leave in a hurry. Toddlers and young children have special diets, meaning they don't typically eat what we've packed in our own kits. So this will probably not be the exact diet they're used to. My grandchildren eat a lot of frozen food, pizza, and chicken nuggets, along with the toy, if you know what I mean. They're not going to be very happy if they're evacuated and these food choices are not available to them. It will be just as important to have toys, games, coloring books, and other toys packed away to keep them occupied during these events. Some kids have access to tablets, and depending on the situation, they may or may not be working. They often require to be charged and often rely on Wi-Fi Again, something that may not readily be available. Older children and teenagers, you know, kids 8 to 12, typically like adventures. And an emergency will seem like an adventure to them if you have a good attitude about it. Make sure that when you're building your kit, they're involved in making their own at the same time. Let them choose some of the foods they would like to eat, within reason. Definitely let them choose the snacks. To keep them busy, books, games can keep their minds off the situation at hand. Now let's talk about physical limitations uh, for everybody. Now people from all ages suffer from physical limitations. These limitations might include mobility issues. These might be temporary from a fall, an auto accident, or another injury that creates a condition that will get better with time and intervention. Permanent physical conditions are things that will not get better, and mobility devices are needed for that person to get around. The condition might be from a loss of a limb or deformity, being severely overweight, maybe they have brittle bones due to age or disease of other ailment. Whatever the reason, in an emergency, it is imperative to ensure these people have the equipment or devices they need. In the event of a motorized wheelchair, Having a battery backup, such as a Jackery or a Goal Zero, or another brand of solar generator available will greatly improve their quality of life. In the event you don't have electricity, or just to have around just in case, you should have things such as crutches, a manual wheelchair, a cane, a few knee braces. I mean, like my house, we've got all that stuff in the storage room because every three to four or six months or so, somebody's getting injured. So. Those are good things to have put away in your kit. Now let's talk about some medical devices for a minute. Now I'm sure you know someone who relies on a medical device in their everyday lives, such as a CPAP machine, an oxygen concentrator, or a nebulizer. Um, all of these devices operate on regular house power and often, sometimes, have a battery backup. How long the battery backup will last depends on the device. A typical CPAP machine, which uses about 40 watts of power, and runs eight hours each night, would consume about 320 watts, or 26.62 amp hours. The Goal Zero Yeti 500 portable power station and a Nomad 50 solar panel, at a cost of about $650, will operate a typical CPAP machine for about seven hours. In comparison, a home oxygen concentrator uses between three and 500 watts per hour making it nearly impossible to provide power on a portable basis. The largest power source offered by Goal Zero is the Yeti Pro 4000 at a cost of nearly $4,000. 
and could only provide enough power to operate the O2 concentrator for six to seven hours at five liters per minute. If the patient uses less oxygen, under three liters per minute, there are portable O2 concentrators that run directly off of direct current and use less power. Many of these devices have detachable batteries that can be charged using solar panels and an inverter, but most batteries only last between three to five hours, depending on the manufacturer. Batteries can be plugged into a vehicle to charge them up, as well as using a portable solar generator. Portable nebulizers have an onboard rechargeable battery that can plug into a car or into a portable backup battery and are relatively inexpensive. As I spoke about in the first video, you will need to have a prepared 72-hour kit and the necessary life-saving equipment ready to go at a moment's notice. Most people don't realize that people with a food allergy can get very sick or even die from ingesting, inhaling, or even touching an item. When they think of food allergies, most people think of peanuts, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. I have a daughter and a couple of grandchildren who suffer from terrible food allergies. In the event of an evacuation, it is imperative that the food you pack in your kit is food you can eat. If you end up at an emergency evacuation center, they will probably not be equipped to provide you with the allergy-free foods you need. One of the best ways to prepare for those with food allergies is to make it yourself. If you have a friend or a family member who has a freeze dryer, this would be the best option for preparing, storing, and freeze drying foods that will work for you. You can do all the prep work at home, freeze everything, and then take it over where it can be put into the freeze dryer. Once the food is complete, all you need to do is seal the meal in Mylar bags and label them accordingly. About 38 million Americans in the United States live with diabetes. Some diabetics rely on insulin injections because their bodies just don't make it. According to the product labels from all three U.S. insulin manufacturers, it is recommended that insulin be stored in a refrigerator at approximately 36 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit. Unopened and stored in this manner, these products maintain potency until the expiration date on the package. However, according to the CDC, during an emergency, such as being evacuated for a fire or a storm, you do not have to store your vials in a cooler. Insulin products contained in the vials or cartridges supplied by the manufacturer, opened or unopened, may be left unrefrigerated at a temperature between 59 degrees and 86 degrees Fahrenheit for up to 28 days and continue to work. Just be sure not to let the vials freeze, store them in direct sunlight, or let it get warmer than 86 degrees Fahrenheit. If you feel more comfortable keeping your vials in a cooler, you might want to look at one that plugs into your car. There are a bunch on Amazon, but make sure to check out the reviews before you buy. Indivi I want to talk about individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities. My wife is a special education teacher, and she loves her kids. They bring her so much joy. When they have emergency lockdown drills at school, the teachers lock the doors, they close the blinds, turn off the lights, and then they move the children to a specific spot in the classroom. For kids in most classes, they all just comply and they go there. But these kids, these kids don't grasp the situation. All they see is this is a break in their everyday routine. If you're, so if you're evacuating with a person with intellectual or developmental disabilities, it's important that you try to keep their routine as, as close to normal as possible. Um, one of the things that, that she does in her class, because she has handheld electronic devices, such as iPads, iPhones, um, those kind of devices, and she has videos and she has activities loaded on them. That would be a great thing to have with your kit. Make sure you have extra chargers or a way to charge up those devices. Um, another thing that I found interesting was to find um, a little small pop-up tent or um, you know, a sheet or a, a tarp or something that you can make a little fort for them. Anything that's going to help dis decrease their visual stimulation in a busy room um, or it just gives them instant privacy. Noise canceling headphones are another great way to decrease auditory stimuli. Now having snacks available is always important, even for the adults like me. 
So if you're now, if you're, so if you're evacuating, <sighs> say hi, Gus. <coughs> say hi to everybody. Hey, say hi. Gonna say hi. All right. Can I get back to my video now? All right. Let's get back to my video. Nope. 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 We're gonna, we're gonna get down. Come on. Lastly, if you're evacuating with someone who has Alzheimer's or dementia, it's important to never leave that person alone because they're prone to just wandering away. And especially in an emergency situation uh, where there's a lot of people, when they wander away, it may be very difficult to find them. Um, the other situation is that they may want to bolt because they, they just freak out and they just decide to, to up and walk away. So if you're in a chaotic environment um, and, and they suddenly disappear, it's going to make your life a lot more stressful. When you're evacuating, you may want to um, manage the changing environment by bringing a pillow or a blanket. I mean, it, I've seen people with stuffed animals or baby dolls um, or other comforting items that they can hold on to. So when you're in a shelter, try to stay away from exits and choose a quiet corner if possible. Um, and if there is an episode of agitation, respond to the emotions being expressed. For example, say, you're frightened and want to go home. It's okay. I'm right here with you. When you're evacuated during an emergency, it is stressful to say the least. Imagine if you had one of these conditions we just talked about. Imagine the stress that is on individuals that live with these conditions every day. It is important that we work with these individuals to help them build their 72-hour kit. And when an emergency arises, that we are there to help them through. If you have a neighbor that you know is housebound, don't talk to them. I have a lady that's over here. She's a widow. She's maybe in her 70s, late 70s. She doesn't get out of the house very much. And in an emergency, me and I've got two neighbors would go and help her out. We're all neighbors. This is what we have to do. So um, thank you so much for watching. Please leave a, a comment because I know I've missed a lot of stuff. And other people out there would love to learn from your experience. So if you have evacuated with a person with a disability or a special ability, um, leave a comment below. I definitely respond to all of my messages. Um, if you missed the first two videos in this series, go back and watch them. I'll, I'll drop a link here. And um, I think that's it. I'll see you next time.